back to Sweden in 2010, on the year exactly before the revolution in Egypt broke out, I've been working uh, with a Swedish foundation called Fina Kvinna, who works with women's organizations in conflict areas, <coughs> supporting activists, women's rights activists, um, to make women take more active parts in politics and in the public sphere. And now, since about seven weeks, I'm trying to shift the focus of my revolution to make it more local because um, I'm Swedish, I'm Hong um, and there are lots of social problems in Sweden as well. And I feel I need to take that responsibility. Um, the fight in Palestine and Israel that I've been working with for a long time and that I'm more of an expert on than my own context is and should be left to the Palestinians, basically. Uh, it's my, my point of view. And before that, I was working for a lot of private foundations in Europe. So I've always been working as a funder um, with different money streams, uh, funding really interesting projects. And I wanted to, to start off today by talking about how to fund the revolution. <laughs> And, of course, the revolution itself is not really fundable because that happens. Uh, but the support that it requires needs funding, and that is why I'm really interested in this conference and um, all the kind of open source initiatives that are supporting revolutions in different ways. And I wanted to start off with asking how many in this room who are actually making a living of what you're doing or, yes, can you raise a hand? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, financially. Can you live on? Can you, can you be more specific? Yeah, yes. so do you get fund Do you get a salary from what you love doing the most? Or do you actually have a job that finances the things that, yeah? I do. I do get. I have no job, but I, I do. I do get. <laughs> I have a great job. You have a great job. Yeah. Well, that's lucky. Try to to educate some social revolutionists. <laughs> so most of the activists that I've been working with uh, are not funded, and also the sort of initiatives that pop up to help these activists are not funded. Um, and I want to also talk about the sort of backside of that, which is burnout. And that exists also in the activists uh, that we see here and, and the, the forums around hackers, hacker spaces. Um, it's, it's a great problem for a lot of activists because there's this feeling that um, nothing will be done if I'm not doing it and that if I'm not helping to do it. And sometimes we need to take a step back. But I want to return to the, the money <laughs> first. I want to give you some tips about where some channels of, of uh, getting funding for, for initiatives that can also be open source initiatives. Um, there's a sort of background history of, of international funding and, and money flows. So I've been working for CEDA in Sweden, which is similar. There's NORAD in, in Norway, for example, and, and there every uh, Nordic government has uh, a funding agency like that. And in the 90s, there was this big boom um, where 
the focus should be on the person that we want to develop. So there is something called human development that was introduced into the UN, um, where um, the, 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 the aid or the development should flow to people, which meant that so, uh, so society got a lot of money to do projects with grassroots. And that worked quite well for the decade until 9-11 happened. And 9-11 completely shifted the, the money streams from this human security kind of aspect or human development aspect to security. So after 9-11, fringe groups, and I say that with it, uh, within quotation marks because fringe groups are seen as, for example, women's human rights defenders, hackers are fringe groups, um, LGBT um, people's rights defenders groups um, are seen and can be categorized in, la uh, in countries that are not democratic as terrorists. And that has been happening since 9-11 that uh, feminists in some countries have been jailed under terrorist laws. Hackers have been jailed under terrorist laws. And this has made funding much more difficult for uh, the Swedish government, especially because I know of the Swedish government mostly. Um, and it has implied that uh, the big corporations and the big um, development agencies such as the UN have actually gotten the most part of the money, which means that money is channeled into big bodies where we're not really sure of where it's going to end up. But the Arab Spring has actually been another breaking point because all of a sudden governments in the Nordic countries have quite a lot of money when it comes to development realize that, okay, we want to be able to help. What can we do? Because all of a sudden, we see initiatives that are popping up that are not within the normal frameworks of, of civil society organizations. They're actually networks, loose networks of, of hackers, loose networks of social uh, media um, sort of glued together uh, organizations that are impossible to fund because there's no bank account. <laughs> and uh, when I was working um, down in Jerusalem, uh, a foreign minister uh, of Sweden came up and said, ah, so we want to fund the, the young women in Gaza who are tweeting because they're really interesting and they're really doing really good things. But how do we reach them? <laughs> and we were like, so now you're talking about funding individuals, and are you just going to give them money and say, yeah, do what you want, you know? And, and that in, in, the, in the context of um, the Swedish development aid, it's also been, there's also been a parallel track of, we need to find out what results this is yielding, you know? We need to know what the taxpayers' money are going to. So what results do you think that you can point at when you're giving money to a young woman in Gaza who's tweeting about her situation, which is fundamental to people outside of Gaza who are not knowing what the situation is like, obviously. But it creates a, a, a difficult problem for, for those policy makers in, in, um, in these countries. So what they've done, and this is, the t <laughs> this is a big tip, they've created um, diffuse <laughs> concepts such as business for development, B for D, that's a, a new track within the Swedish governmental agency. And they actually don't know themselves what it means, which means that there's a grand opportunity for you to say what it means, or to define it. Within B for D, there's another, I will write these up uh, in a minute. Within B for D, there's another track called ICT for D. ICT for development. And they don't know what that is either. So basically, I think what's happening is that governmental agencies are reaching out to people who actually know what they're talking about. Basically, you guys. <laughs> um, and there is a chance here to define, because they have a lot of money, these groups, but they actually don't know what to do with them. 
So if you have good ideas <laughs> of what you would like to, to fund, don't hesitate to, to contact people within these groups. I can tell you that the, the guy who sort of runs the B4D at SIDAC is called Johan Åkeblom. I can write that up too, I um, And they really want to be in touch with people. Now, with activist groups, there's also um, a sort of a problem of, of fusing language. And language is really important. So we speak a language here, the people at this conference have a language that is very much, I mean, unknown to me in lots of ways because I uh, do use open source uh, at home on my computer, but I'm not, I, I'm not a hacker, I don't understand the, the technology behind it. And that's the, the exact same way in uh, the government's labels. And so there needs to be sort of a, a way to meet. Uh, the, I would suggest that you who want to try and find funding for the revolution through these uh, channels, read up on the very few documents that they have online about B4D and ICT4D, and understand the, the language that they're speaking, and then t like trying to make a definition of what it is that you're doing, and giving them hints about, okay, you guys need to do it differently. Like, this is actually what is, uh, what is interesting. Um, and also maybe like actually educate them in, in the way that they're using words, because ICT for me, like, it's, it's um, quite broad and it says very little. So, I wanted to, to, to talk about this mostly because I'm as a, as a person who's worked with activists for a long time, I recognize the problems of not being funded. Um, and it has to do with working a lot uh, and giving all your energy to a course without being paid for it sometimes. Um, and also in very special circumstances where everybody has kind of adopted a way of, of feeling like, okay, we're now, uh, we're now fighting for this course together and we're gonna do everything in our power to do it. And actually, you don't ever reflect on how you're feeling yourself. So we've been working with this sense because activists need security and they need security of on, online as well because obviously they're letting uh, go a lot of personal information and a lot of our Israeli uh, activists that we were working with, women's rights activists, um, are threatened by their society because they're usually very left-wing and, and they're usually also very pro-Palestinian and that's not very common in the mainstream of Israeli society. And so these women get threatened uh, by people in their community, quite often religious people or just really right-wing politicians who are saying, like, these are guys, the settlements are good. <laughs> you don't understand. And the women's rights activists are put in, into a dilemma because they know that um, the Israeli mainstream is not right. I mean, they've sort of been uh, brainwashed with, uh, with talk about how the situation is. Now, I'm, this is very personal, but, but that's uh, what I feel. Um, and so they go out to marches uh, and they go to demonstrate uh, in a place called Sheikh Jarrah in um, Jerusalem. And these women quite often actually get harassed, sexually harassed, by Palestinian men now. And as Jewish Israeli women, they feel like they cannot talk about that because they feel guilty about the situation that they're in. So we're occupying you, but you're harassing me sexually and I cannot speak about that. So there is this heavy weight uh, on, on the women who are of in a uh, 
double dilemma. They're sort of, they feel like they're um, upper middle class or middle class, and they can go home and just turn, uh, you know, close the door, and then um, everything else will will be okay. I mean, within their little society, it is. But the Palestinians are living within boundaries in the West Bank and Gaza, and that doesn't change. So there is a luxury problem. And at the same time, they don't have any money. They're not funded. They don't, you can't really get very much money for working as a, a women's rights activist in Israel. So the average age of an activist in Israel, and I mean sort of lifespan age, is about three years. You can't do it for more than three years. You burn out after. There's, you know, you have to take another job to finance all the, um, all the debts that you've gotten into over the past year. And of course this happens in Palestine as well. Now Palestine is a, 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 a country, because it's the state now, um, where there's so much development money that is channeled in. And uh, so most people who are activists are actually funded, but now there's a, a, an activist movement and especially an open source activist movement, actually, that is trying to reclaim the old ways of, for example, um, doing uh, like farming and, and things that have been, have been lost a little bit uh, because of the enormous amounts of money that have been channeled in. And with the money comes, okay, here guys, you can do farming, but do it our way. You know, in Sweden we have the best ways of farming, so you can do it that way. So you mess up the ways in which people are actually uh, traditionally doing things. Uh, and at the same time, there's also a problem with the sort of social um, development. So yes, like, as you can see, I've worked for CEDA, but I'm really not very pro-development. I think that development aid money should go to developing tools and, and, and methods for activists to be used and applied as they themselves see fit um, and as they find uh, important. I'm, I'm not very structured, but uh, <laughs> um, I sort of had the idea that I wanted to have more of a discussion because there's been so many fantastic talks and so many fantastic PowerPoint presentations and I feel like. <laughs> Sorry? There was no PowerPoint there at all. There was one. There, there was, was one, it was me. I confess. There was one. No, well, I went to another one, and there was a, well, another room as well, and there were PowerPoints there. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, pressy to, I, you know. <laughs> um, no, and, and I think from yesterday I took um, some things with me that is very related to this whole um, activist environment of the sort of very quiet revolution in Palestine, let's say, uh, because of course it's been happening for a long time. Go to Egypt, for example, and see the Arab Spring. It happened now, three, two years ago? <laughs> two years ago. And already the activists that were involved in, in 2011 have changed. Like there's been a generational shift there are some, some people who are still active, but a lot of the people who um, took out a year, almost, for the course of the revolution in 2011, have now have to go, go back to working and, and to, to sort of rebuild. And a lot of them have gotten married, because in Egypt, it's just, you know, you get to a certain age and you have to get married or you're socially excluded a little bit. So, so some of my friends have actually done that. Um, but they assured me when I called them that Anna will be back. It's okay. <laughs> We're just taking a break now, having some kids and stuff. And no one will But so so this kind of um, the activist networks are always based on. We were saying this yesterday as well. Quite like-minded, usually upper class or middle class people who are in the position of quite luxury, actually, um, of being able to do it, of being able to support the cause. 
At the same time, that means that you have to have the support from your family, and especially in the Arab world, and not least when you're a woman. Because when you're a woman, um, I can take an example of a woman called Mona, for example, and she's, uh, in, she's working in Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, it's such a patriarchal society that you cannot be an activist in your little, uh, little part of Jerusalem, like so your little village, they call them villages, but it's actually part of uh, Jerusalem. You have to go to another village to be an activist because social control is so heavy in Jerusalem. And this Mona, she makes uh, online uh, YouTube videos uh, from various rallies and she covers um, the Israeli violence against the Palestinians when uh, they raid these uh, small villages. And she puts everything online. And two months ago, Mona called me and was destroyed. She was telling me that a man who she caught on film uh, while, while doing um, a film from a rally is a politician. And he's a very, very, um, um, a very sort of prominent politician who has a lot of the mafia-like ties to everybody. And he's now threatening her to, because apparently she's caught a moment where he has been um, talking about things that put him in a very beautiful light. So he is like she has actually captured some kind of propaganda uh, moment for this guy. Um, and and she, uh, she hates this man. I mean, she thinks that he's a terrible politician. She doesn't want to, to release this film to him and give him the rights to the film, which is what he claims that, she, uh, that, uh, that he wants. And he has the right to, because, of course, I am the one on the film, so come on, give me the film. And he's actually blackmailing Mona, saying that if you don't do this, I will tell your family and I will tell everybody in Jerusalem that you are a collaborator with Israelis. And this kind of, of reality is quite, um, for us, I mean, for me, it's inconceivable, but it's, uh, it's true for most women's rights activists in Jerusalem, because the patriarchal society implies that they have really nowhere to turn except for their own family. And unless you have a family who's super, super powerful, and can stand against this kind of, uh, of, of blackmail, then you're in deep trouble. Which means that a lot of women who work as activists and who do activist um, work um, in Jerusalem are actually moving away from there and, and move to the West Bank where they feel safer. So, yesterday I, I was thinking about, especially during um, um, Mike's talk uh, about identity and, and reputation, and I was thinking, you guys, you need to know about feminist theory, <laughs> because, because um, I think um, there, is, there is a machismo and a patriarchal norm set that is translated into hacker spaces, that is translated even, even, even into the civil society of the women's rights organizations in Palestine. They're not safe spaces. They're not spaces where you can say, hey, listen, I'm feeling quite bad today. I can't go with you to the rally. I can't, you know, can't march up and say, okay, listen, I went to the front line today, I'm the coolest, you know, that's the kind of norms that, that we're tackling, even within the women's rights activist groups. And I think that that's translatable into almost every activist group. Um, and I think that that is causing a lot of problems within the, the, the participants themselves. Because well, so, um, let's take a step back. Uh, I, together with a colleague in Jerusalem, we created this thing called integrated security. Because we were talking about security online, and we were talking about security and identity 
online as something that activists need to, to be aware of. And we're working a lot with Frontline. I don't know if you're aware of them, but and also Urgent Action Fund, who also work with um, with this kind of issues. And we developed this concept called integrated security, which basically is t taking a step back and looking at yourself and saying, okay, how am I doing actually? Am I okay? Have I been to see a doctor uh, lately for the pain that I have somewhere, maybe? So, for example, with our Serbian activists, uh, women's activists, we um, had a workshop talking about, okay, are you seeing yourself as an, <coughs> as an individual in this, or are you just busy fighting the cause? And it turned out that um, several women had not been to the dentist in 20 years. <laughs> they had not been to see a doctor uh, in like, I don't know, 30 years maybe. And most of them actually like had pains and were suffering from toothaches and things and they just let their, you know, everything go basically. And it's because the cost is so much greater than your own uh, person. And for women, you have a double problem because if you're an activist, you most probably have a family too, that you have to care for. And so there's absolutely no room for yourself. And within hacker spaces, I've seen the tendency of creating this, um, this situation, this bonding situation that is <coughs> also very uh, sort of hyped by um, basically male so social norms. Um, and we were talking about that yesterday. Um, that it's, it's um, well, Karen was saying that somebody had said nice boobs to her when she put up a presentation. That was very, that's a, a one example. But, but I think there's a lot of sort of sexist remarks that come up. Um, and it's not <coughs> actually about sexism. It's more about challenging the patterns of how we relate to each other. Um, and I think it's fundamental because I think it's fundamental for the group, but I think it's also fundamental for the individuals to, to start thinking about themselves and thinking, okay, how am I feeling? How, am, I, am I okay like, as, a, as a, a person? Because, you know, in activist circles, a lot of pretty broken people come together and just break each other a little bit. <laughs> And it creates, a, it creates an even more patriarchal and macho sort of structure. And I mean, <coughs> trust me, the whole Palestinian women's movement is like this. And if it's like that in the Palestinian women's movement, you know, uh, you can only think what it is with a male-dominated <laughs> sort of similar. And I was thinking about the thing that, about identity and reputation, and it's so, such a militaristic uh, concept. And feminism is very much about fighting militaristic concepts. Like, <laughs> at least to me. <laughs> um, fighting in a non militaristic way. Well, sorry? Fighting in a non militaristic way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, fighting is a bad word, see? Even me. <laughs> um, so, I think. Um, we need to, to ask ourselves the things that we're, we're creating, even online. Uh, are they just trying to, to take the kind of power structures that we see in society today that we're actually working against, sort of money and the power that it creates, uh, and also sort of power relations? Have we actually looked at our uh, new systems and our new technology through the lens of power and power dynamics. And we were talking about yesterday that, that there is a problem of accessibility, there is a problem that we're mostly white, <laughs> middle class, um, well, you know, <laughs> uh, depending on where you are. <laughs> yeah. um, and we need to, to find ways in which, and that's also why it's so important that women are uh, connected to, to FSCOMs and to, to creating um, open source technology.
technology because we're able to question those power dynamics. If you don't invite people in uh, to create solutions that are fitting everybody, it will become a problem eventually. Um, yeah, I wanted to have. <laughs> the, am I challenging you? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, everybody's nodding, so everybody seems to be thinking that this is this is true. But how do we get from where we are <coughs> to to going to the next place? Like, how do we bring in this kind of awareness? Yeah. So, so one question is like what. Okay, so referring to, to Mike's talk yesterday, for example, so what, what projects, <coughs> did you see any of the projects he talked about that could be object for, for raising funds from, for example, CEDA? Like, did you have, oh, yeah. no, 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 did you see any ideas and, and maybe it would it make sense to form a project around those questions that you talked about? Yeah, um, definitely. And well? to be uh, honest, I mean, there's nothing sexier to, to see that than, than, <coughs> than adding gender to ICT for D, <laughs> you know, to be honest. So, yeah, definitely. Um, you have to package it well, and it's not, uh, it's not really a problem. But yes, I definitely see that. And I see that, that, that open source technology is the future also for the, the, the Swedish and the, the Nordic. Funders, basically, because those are tools that will grow. And also the fact that they are adaptable to the setting in which they're used is very important. Uh, they were asking how to get to the next place and next stage. I think they were, they, we should ask and explain for them. What is the next place? What is the goal? Yeah. That's well, the think, first. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's true. And I think the goal is. I, I, sometimes I don't even like the word democracy, you know. <laughs> but that's but, too vague. Yeah, it is too vague. But I think that a representation. I mean, you were you were asking a question yesterday in some talk uh, about freedom and justice, and I think the thing about fairness. Fairness is more important. Yeah, you're right. And I think if we want to create. Uh, tools to create a better uh, and a different world from the world as it looks today, where we question the, the paradigms and the, the, the concepts that very many people take, take for granted. I think we need to do it in um, a more um, in a more <coughs> heterogeneous uh, environment and because we're working with world like the thing is I think the, the the systems as they are created today were created in a very isolationist kind of mindset and, and colloquialism and so on so now we we can we can actually surpass that we can we can get to a place where we create tools for for everybody who can be involved who are who are willing to be involved from wherever it might be, you know, it doesn't need to be here. Yes, we have uh, a lot of the money and, and maybe the, the assets in that kind of sense to, to start being the ones who build it up, but we also need to take influences from outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you um, think that it's possible to go against adversaries who have long-term strategies and long-term infrastructures well, the political use supports have a, a lifetime of two years. Yeah. <laughs> this is this asymmetry is needs to be tackled somehow because yeah. otherwise you always. By the way, by the time these people you care about are trained, they fall out of yeah. of the system. Yeah. Exactly. No, you're right. Uh, and how? I mean, the only way to tackle that is on a broad front, actually, to 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 spend time on on caring about uh, the individuals as much as the collective activists, let's say. That's one part of it. But then the other part of it is also to be inclusive, I think. I mean, to try and... Uh, as much as... But, well, no, not as much as possible. That's not a good uh, way of saying it. We should force ourselves a little bit more, maybe, sometimes, I think. 
to, to be broader because also activists, we tend to feel like we're the only ones who can solve a problem mm. sometimes. And there are a lot of people who can actually help and to be involved, I think. But I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, as I understand it, there are sort of two answers that you've touched on to the question of how to extend the life expectancy yeah. of an activist career. And I think that's a really important question for exactly the reasons that you brought up. And the first one is you know, getting more people funded or at least you know, into a stable, rather than, uh, a stable situation rather than a situation where things are getting worse for them month by month in terms of their economic <laughs> situation. I mean, yeah, we were talking to... Uh, is Smari here? Has yeah. he got out of bed? Yeah. yeah. Are, you, are, are you prepared to talk about your financial situation? No, not really. No, that's fine. <laughs> we were talking to somebody completely different than Smari who was talking about how much debt they got into over a long period of time and how nice it was to be finally in a situation where they were paying off debt month by month rather than getting further and further into debt. And like, that's the same for me. I've just managed to pay off about £4,000 of debt that had been hung around my neck from before I left the UK 18 months ago. But frankly, you know, if I didn't have a partner who had a grown-up job, I would really struggle to be <laughs> doing what I'm doing right now. And that's not a long-term strategy. Well, I hope it's a long-term strategy, but no, not a long-term strategy um, for my I don't think my rent can, can sustain that grown-up job for too much longer. No, exactly. I don't know. <laughs> it's going to get thrown out. But, um, so two strategies for extending life expectancy. One is improving the economic um, situation so that being an activist doesn't always mean getting into more and more shit, personally, financially. Uh, and the other one is what you're talking about with the integrated security stuff, which is you know, actually building a culture where people look after themselves and look after each other, rather than a culture in which you know, the cause is so important that it would be selfish of me to deal with the fact that things are getting more and more fucked up in my life. And I think there's another answer too. I think there's, well, or actually it sort of it's, it goes over those two, and it's, it's about creating communities. Like, communities where you can, where you can actually talk about your problems as well as, as solutions to, to problems uh, in the world. And, and in Palestine, for example, actually villages uh, in the sort of uh, fringes where, they've been, uh, where Israel has been building um, the wall, they've been coming together and protesting every Friday. And it's like a standing thing that's been happening for the past five years. And there are some uh, great films about this as well. But there, they've created um, sort of community-based media agencies where uh, some savvy internet users <clears throat> are putting up stuff that is happening in the, uh, in the community and where women and children and, uh, and fathers and, and elders come out and protest against Israel. And actually, in these parts, we don't see uh, as much violence against women, for example. We don't see these kind of effects that uh, usually are prevalent in Palestinian so uh, societies. So community is really important. And I think, I think one of the wonderful things about this kind of conference is that it sort of creates a community as well. But it's important also to, to see each other, um, to have face-to-face -face meetings. I don't think that internet is a good like, substitute for face-to-face for -face. And that's why a conference like this is good. Yes. Yes, and that's quite dangerous as well because the, the people in power, they are ahead of us and uh, they can spot people and arrest them because they uh, see them on uh, films, on videos. So it's a, well, delusion that uh, about the rap spring and the Facebook things and uh, because the power is so strong, and also the patriarchal power, and people under power, I've been working in Russia for the last uh, five years, and uh, if you can't beat them, join them. And we have found a um, model of doing entrepreneurship. That's the great buzzword in, in, in a lot of those countries. And to do community work. But to do community work in a kind of 
way of linking into it. So we can get money for entrepreneurship to make the villages to find new ways of uh, supporting the villages so people don't move into bigger towns to make it uh, possible to live in those remote areas and working in the Arctic. And uh, there we kind of link into and get the money for entrepreneurship. But then we work uh, as psychologists in family therapy to strengthen the families. Because what's really uh, also burning out is um, drug abuse among men, especially alcoholism, yeah. which ruins the families and of course burn out those women. The women has to save the Arctic, they have to save the community, they have to be activists. And no wonder they burn out, because uh, it's a patriarch patriarchal system that women has to uh, tend to the family, to breed children, to, to do all those things. And women are used for saving, saving the revolution, saving the local village, and you all guys here are damned <laughs> patriarch. <laughs> all I think we you. all are. I mean, and, well, well. well I, I'm doing this to kind of provoking, to, to make you think about it. You know, my son here. <laughs> and uh, be, because it's so deep rooted in our culture that you, you never question it. Yeah. And, um, so we do empowerment with women under the umbrella of local development, local and regional development, where you get the funding. And then we do some subversive activities in this, because a lot of those women are uh, um, the people that take part in those uh, workshops for um, uh, final, um, economic development in, in the villages, they are women as well. Yeah, yeah I think uh, that's a problem so as it well. Needs a, uh, it's needs a, a lot of kind of um, support for those women. If you want yeah. to use them, they are very useful. That's why the patriarchs use them. Yeah. So the, the supportive thing, and of course with um, solutions uh, of IT solutions to use um, digital services for example they can get a lot of support that will ease their jobs yeah. and that's why we need to work together and uh, we, we talk about healthy families is important yeah. to, to, to have yeah. a healthy community. I think, I think that, that that's a, an important thing because I, I think that putting a lot of um, this feminist thing is usually uh, ascribed to women. Mm. <laughs> and actually, the theory behind it, you guys who come to this conference are super smart. You should all read Bell Hooks uh, and things uh, similar to her where you actually start questioning what the hell we're believing in. And I mean, this. We have all, more or less, uh, started questioning the uh, economic uh, system and all these things. Actually, just going to feminist theory will help us question some of the other things, like the militaristic uh, terms and, and concepts and the power structures that we are emulating in almost all our, our circumstances. And I mean, I do it just as as anybody else, so I'm not, you know, better than, but I can start questioning because I've, I've started mm -hmm. seeing. I see a conflict in what you say here, because you say you want to have an inclusive uh, community, I guess, with as many yeah. participants yeah. as possible, and I think this is exactly, again, such a military structure that you get to when you go there. And the small hyperspaces that are actually not as inclusive as you want to, yeah. those are actually these decentralized 
smaller pockets of resistance yeah. that could be a counter example to this military um, architecture that you just want to I get agree. rid of. I agree, but I, I agree to a lot of that. But, but the thing is then, what concepts uh, do we choose to use when we're meeting in the hyperspace? How, how do we see to the power structures that we're creating in the hyperspaces? within the group itself. But I think that's the, the most important thing. I don't say, I mean, every group is different. Every community is different. You have a, a different set of cultural sort of underlying aspects. Uh, you have a different set of maybe class related and so on. Um, and I think within every group, every community, there are power structures. And there, yeah, there are. <laughs> um, and it's just a way of being aware of that, and a way of, of understanding that um, sometimes it's good. I just see the awareness as the important thing, uh, and the trying uh, of getting rid of some of those um, aspects that go into to, to terms that are used by, by militaristic society that we're all trying to, to, to fight against and, and hack most of all, I know that. That's I mean, there's a classic feminist text, The Tyranny of Structurelessness, yeah. which is a really good description of the yeah. kinds of power, um, the kinds of problems of power that arise in spaces that conceive of themselves as having achieved horizontal yeah. um, organisation. Um, but I wanted to ask you if you go back to something that you mentioned early on, which it might be useful for you to say more about, which is to do with language and particularly uh, interfacing with government and government agencies and how to read the documents that they put out. Look for the terms that are both key terms but actually also quite undefined once you start talking to the people inside the agencies and then build things that connect the language of the work that you're doing to the terms that they have set as the criteria for funding. And I think that's, I've watched you do that as something that you've got a real skill at that I don't, I'm not good at. And I just thought you might say more about it. Well, every, everybody has that. Everybody, every group, again, every community have a set of words that we use in a way uh, that for us are absolutely, uh, we know them and we own them. Mm. And then when we're trying to do something, perhaps with another group, we guess what the other group are going to, to use for words. And we use buzzwords that we've heard around, perhaps on Twitter or perhaps somewhere else. And this is what the government is doing. So they're picking up on those buzzwords, but your job is to define them for, for the government, basically, because you have the potential and the power because you know... Uh, what are you talking about? The, yeah, you know what it is about. So, so defining what they lack yeah. I was thinking about this uh, activist exiting opportunity. I guess people won't get into a situation where you can stop and go to every single rally and still be kind of involved, involved in the discussion with your past experience and so on. Yeah, it's funny because again, like in the Middle East, um, it easily becomes groups again like groups that they define as communities and sometimes they're not very inclusive also as in like okay they're the older generation and, and then they make they make themselves into uh, a concept basically that so we were the first to start the revolution and maybe now they're a bit dormant or some of them at least like not all of them uh, and then the new ones uh, the the situation has changed so much from 2011 to today, so that we don't see the parallel, like, the, the situation isn't the same. And so we're struggling against different things in society. And therefore, these groups are tending to, just as, as this language thing, we're talking about different things here. And, and we were fighting Mubarak then, and now, well, you know, some are fighting against uh, Sisi, and some are fighting to get back Mursi or, you know, um, so they don't tend to, to merge. There is, of course, an elite layer of, of people who are, are continuously working with the actual, 
of support mechanisms to try and fuel uh, the revolution and to try and, and, and keep it going. Because in Egypt, the revolution started in 2011 and it's by no means done, obviously. So there is a, a, an underlying group there. But the thing is, with, um, with the activist groups that have come up since 2011, they're looking very different. So uh, now there are a lot of, of uh, Islamic activists, even young women Islamic activists, who are saying, but why did you do this to us? You know, we want more to <laughs> And there's a lot of... Uh,